I'd like to introduce David Gleason, who will also then introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Kate. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening um, for the third uh, event in this celebration of the 250th anniversary of the Robert Longhouse. Uh, the, 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 um, building the Robert Longhouse in Colonial Fells Point was a tremendous achievement and certainly set the tone for the mercantile and the business um, uh, organization that Fells Point and success at Fells Point enjoyed for the last 250 years. With that, um, I'd like to introduce Jean Baker. Jean is a um, noted author and historian. She is a professor of history at Goucher College. And Jean, a welcome to uh, Fells Point and to the Preservation Thanks. Society. Thank you. I want to begin with a, a, a poem that all of you know. Give me your tired, your poor, <laughs> your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lap beside the golden door. Now, perhaps for us, uh, there are some Trump-like comments in there. <laughs> Wretched refuse, I don't suppose we would say. But nonetheless, the point is that this is classic. These are classic words that were extended by our better selves to those including all of our ancestors who came and still come to the United States. Nowhere, I believe, were Emma Lazarus's words more significant than in Fells Point. Uh, the Baltimore neighborhood that we celebrate with this special 250th anniversary of the Robert Long House. We don't have in Baltimore a Statue of Liberty or an Ellis Island. But we do have memories of those who came to this place intent on becoming Americans, perhaps at first becoming hyphenated Americans, and then having their children become assimilated and just Americans. They were called a century ago, and language is really important here, the foreign born. Increasingly as time went on, they were called aliens. They thought of themselves as refugees and new Americans. These immigrants to Fells Point represent our national diversity and our long-term commitment as Americans to our nation as a sanctuary, which is diverse enough to incorporate all peoples. If we think, and perhaps Dean, you do, to write a history of the immigrants in Fells Point, we find that immigrants were Fells Point history. In the 18th century, they came from England and Scotland. Uh, the Quaker Robert Long was one of them, arriving from England by way of Pennsylvania and service in the American Revolution. In the 1840s and 50s, a new group of Europeans came from Ireland and Germany and then after the Civil War, immigrants increasingly came from southeastern Europe and Poland. It is this last group uh, that I will focus on this evening. Those who came from Poland during the period from 1880s until the late 1920s when restrictive immigration legislation, policies that were based on national origins favoring Northwestern Europeans, along with the Great Depression, because who, after all, leaves their homeland to go uh, to another country where the un unemployment rate is 25 percent? When these two things, the Depression and new legislation, choked off their numbers. In the early part of, this, of the century, uh, immigrants disembarked in Fells Point. And as steamships got bigger and bigger, 
and drew more depth. They couldn't dock anymore in Baltimore. And so Fells Point, with its deeper channel of 27 feet, became the favored, favored point. Later, they disembarked across the way uh, in Locust Point and traveled across the upper part of the Patapsco River. Some who landed in Baltimore went westward, hoping, and this is especially true of uh, Polish uh, migrants, to be landowning farmers. After all, this is what they had been in their old lives. If you had a few more dollars in Poland, uh, you could purchase a ticket that would take you beyond Baltimore to the Midwest. And by 1880, several transatlantic companies had established an international trade with Baltimore. And this is what happened. Uh, they would take our agricultural goods, cotton, grain, some iron, to Europe and bring back the human ballast. And chief among the human ballast uh, during the period I'm talking about were Polish Catholics who made Fells Point their home, creating here a little Poland, Polonia, by 1900. Before World War I, Baltimore was second only to New York in the number of immigrants received. By 1928, 50,000 Baltimoreans of a population of about 750,000 had been born in Poland. And this figure does not include a growing number of second generation Poles. Now, to this story of taking in uh, the poor, the lonely, uh, there is another side of ourselves. And uh, this is the less friendly nativist one. Uh, it is a recurrent theme, and we hear it today as we confront tensions over immigration policy. They are not sending their best people, says Donald Trump in 2015. Let's build a 2,000 mile around, uh, wall around our southern border. Let's cut off the number of legal migrants, says Jeb Bush. Uh, who worries that in the old days, new Americans assimilated, but they're not doing that anymore. In the early years of the 20th century, exclusionary nativist views were held by some in Baltimore's Protestant <coughs> community, who believed that their city was being overrun by illiterate, ignorant Poles, who gave their primary allegiance to a pope in Rome. Meanwhile, Conservative business leaders in Baltimore link immigrants to unionization and growing radicalism, as well as crime. And of course, workers always feared competition for jobs. During the Depression of 1893, uh, that, by the way, is the second worst uh, depression in American history. During that depression, a member of the American Protective Association <coughs> a nativist group, came to Baltimore and told a crowd of unemployed Baltimoreans that their jobs had gone to a flood of immigrants loosed on America by papal agents. By the 1920s, American lawmakers agreed, passing laws limiting the number of immigrants and creating new federal policies that favored, as I've suggested, Western Europe. Before this, the national government really had very little to do uh, with immigration. And America was, in this early period, in terms of its visions, an asylum where the blessings of liberty could await all humans. Americans were guided in this vision by their sense, and it is an enduring one, that out of many, there could be one. They were also guided by a practical need to fill up an empty nation and get some workers. Tonight, as we consider Polish immigration, uh, the story has to begin in Europe because every immigration story is a matter of the push 
that is the circumstances that lead people to abandon their birthplaces and travel to distant unknown locations. Now this is balanced by the pull, and of course that is the attractiveness of the place uh, to which they hope to go. And in some cases, immigrants come for both reasons, uh, that is more freedom, and also economic advantage. Uh, today, this is the distinct distinction between being a refugee and a migrant. In the case of the Poles, their national history was surely part of the push. And their reasons for coming from 1880s through the 1920s were both economic and political. Poland, for those of you who remember your, your history books, has been called the sick man of Europe. And that is certainly the case during the 18th and 19th centuries, when first in the 1790s, the ancient state was partitioned into three parts, always, always uh, to be with territorial limits that were violated, first by, by Russians, uh, then by Germans, or it's at first by Prussians, but uh, uh, Prussia is beginning to be Germany, and Austria. Uh, Poland was a country during this period that had no political identity, but it was held together by a religion, Catholicism, a sense of repressed national <laughs> identity, and a language. But it was not an effective nation state, and Polish peasants living in land controlled by Prussia, Austria, and Russia, were subject to conscription into uh, the army of uh, a, a national identity that they considered uh, not to be theirs. Uh, think here of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Uh, Polish lands were confiscated, especially Bismarck, came down with very restrictive policies in which uh, Poles could not acquire, lease, or inherit land. And while these were the general conditions that face uh, Poles, uh, ethnic Poles living in uh, Germany uh, and Austria and Russia, uh, there were specific reasons to be pushed from their homeland for example, the failure of the potato crop in 1895. All of us know about the Irish potatoes fail, uh, but Polish potatoes fail too. <laughs> These oppressive conditions help explain the push that amounted to a massive migration. Between 1870 and 1914, more than four million and a half Poles left ethnically Polish lands for the United States. They were encouraged to do that, this uh, by agents who traveled from village to village promoting the benefits of leaving their past for a glorious future where if goal was not found in every street, at least a better life was possible. After the Civil War, Maryland, the state of Maryland had such an agent who promoted jobs and advertised the opportunities in the free state. Sometimes a letter from a relative who had already made this journey was enough to seal a, depart a departure. Though approximately one third of these Polish immigrants were illiterate. In any case, the United States Postal Service served as a very effective agency promoting migration. Here is one letter from Adam Rakowski. For those of you who know Polish, apologies for my pronunciation. He's writing in 1904 to his sister. At first, I had no work, but now I've gotten very good and easy work for $8 a week. In Poland, I could not earn enough for a loaf of bread. Soon, he was sending relatives money you know, to join him. But others complained that life in the United States was not so easy. There's always a grumbler in, in every group. My dear, wrote one, in America it is no better than in our country. Whoever does poorly suffers in misery everywhere. 
No, it is just as in our country, and the churches are like ours, and in general, everything is alike. Another noted the astonishing fact that in America, you were not allowed to beat your children. <laughs> one of the really constant complaints of all immigrants is that traditional family relationships of parent to child or wife to husband were overturned by legal regulations in the United States. Having made up their mind to leave and found enough money to buy a ticket, a ticket just to Baltimore cost seven dollars, which uh, in today's money is about two hundred dollars. The immigrants traveled by foot or wagon, sometimes by railroad. Here, here we see the intervention of the industrializing state on this process of immigration. And they went to Hamburg and Bremen, the major points of emigration. By 1870, the North German Lloyd Company, which is a big player in the Polish migration, had organized regular departures from Bremen to Baltimore on steamships named America, Ohio. And this journey that they would embark on uh, took two weeks to cross the Atlantic. They mostly came as families. And in their new life, and many of them in Fells Point, they were held together by ties of blood. They came intending to stay and not, as is the case with Italians and some uh, Asians, they were not birds of passage. They did not expect to come and make some money and go home. And the journey was not a pleasant one. They were jammed into steerage, the bottom part of the boat. Having survived the, the journey, they faced new challenges as the vessels entered the Chesapeake Bay. Now, in the past, no one paid much attention to who and how many came uh, to the United States. There, of course, are exceptions among them. The Know Nothing Party of the 1850s, which was an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant group. But generally, before the Civil War, uh, the new republic with its quantities of land, its need for labor, uh, was a receptive to all. But after the Civil War, and as a result of the Civil War, uh, new standards of citizenship emerged in uh, specifically the first section of the 14th Amendment. Uh, we have heard uh, about this section increasingly in our political lives. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction are citizens of the United States. So what the United States begins to do is to set up requirements for citizenship and to begin the process of controlling who comes. Maryland, for example, established a Bureau of Immigration and while the control of immigration falls under federal authority, uh, in this period it was certainly under state supervision. It was not numbers that they cared about. It was health and your ability to work. As the ships bearing Polish immigrants began their journey up the Chesapeake Bay, public health officials, it's a new specialty in medicine, public health, speaking in this strange English language, boarded the ships and examined every man, woman, and child, searching for signs of typhus, cholera, smallpox, tuberculosis, and especially an eye disease that we don't think about anymore, trachoma. It's a bacterial infection, it's contagious, and if the inspectors decided that you had trachoma, you were kept on board and returned to Bremen. By 1895, you were asked your age, your sex, your marital status, your ability to read and write, your final destination, and whether you were a polygamous. Now, the reason for that was that there was a big to-do during the 1890s 
about what was going on out west with Brigham Young's group. Uh, federal law, by this time, excluded idiots, insane persons, paupers, or persons suffering from a loathsome disease. Uh, that's bureaucrat tease for syphilis and gonorrhea. There were also uh, failed efforts to establish uh, literacy requirement. By 1900, you were asked whether you were an anarchist. One can tell the whole history of America by the kinds of questions uh, that were asked of immigrants. And whether you believed in the overthrow of the government. Women without marriage licenses, you can imagine what the uh, officials thought they might be. Old men, like 60-year-old Joe Odowiski from Lodi, and he's from Poland, were considered unable to work, and they were kept on board and sent home. After the Civil War, John Garrett, a, an exceptionally uh, agile president of the B&O, signed an agreement with the North German steamship line to offer a single ticket to those who wanted to come to America. Now, it was possible to disembark and most of these ships by this time are coming into Locust Point, walk a few steps, board a train in Locust Point where the B&O had built a new tra track for the trip to the Midwest. By 1907, 66,000 immigrants, an all-time high, arrived in Baltimore. So many that the B&O began a new pier and an immigration center in Locust Point. By 1913, not quite as many immigrants were coming uh, in, but nonetheless, the state of Maryland authorized the building of a million dollar pier. You know what this is, a recreation pier with a ballroom, a structure that, as many of you know, still exists across the street and is on its way, I believe, to a new life as a fancy hotel. The largest of these uh, ships, such as the America, carried as many as 2,000 immigrants. Those without the money to <coughs> board Garrett's uh, railroad and travel west uh, stayed in Fells Point, where unskilled jobs were abundant. Having been farmers in the old country, they became urban residents. And that's really a, a shocking disconnect, if one, we could imagine it. And they nonetheless created a new life for themselves, as well as a new community in Baltimore. The first Polish immigrants arrived in 1868. By 1870, there were 10 Polish families in Fells Point. By 1880, 110 fam Polish families lived in Fells Point, and they were clustered. You can see this in the census around the streets that you know so well. Lancaster, Alice Anna, Anna, Bond, Lancaster, Wolf, etc. They worked in factories. Here again, uh, the meeting of the process of industrialization uh, with their new lives. Uh, and, but they mostly worked as unskilled laborers, relying on their physical strength to make a weekly wage. Remember one in an oral history, and oral histories, by the way, are a, a really excellent uh, source to find out about this group. Uh, this is what one remember. I sh a shovel was thrust into one hand, and I was rushed into a street excavating as though I had been born here. Another noted that work is everywhere. All you need is your two hands. Another said that he was hired before he even had a place to stay. Now, some worked in the famed port-related activities of Fells Point as stevedores, carriers, and draymen. They clustered as well, as well in the new post-Civil War industries like canning, slaughterhouses, and fertilizer plants. Fells Point was adjacent to Baltimore's specialty of clothing manufacturing, but for the most part, Polish Catholics did not work in the needle trades. 
these were dominated by Czech and Jewish immigrants. The pay was four to ten times higher than in Poland, but prices were higher too. According to one survey, you needed $900 a year for a family to, uh, uh, five I guess that is, um, and on average, the, uh, the families in Fells Point earned only $595. The difference, of course, as always, was made up by female, mostly, and child labor. Uh, this is sort of a shocking uh, time period in, in American history in terms of the uh, work patterns of children. Uh, children under 14 represented 8% of the city's workforce. Many of these were Polish children who stripped and rolled tobacco in the city's cigar manufacturing. Others, especially the women, worked on the canning factory that had opened over on Wall Street, canning oysters. Someone here will explain to me what a canned oyster would taste like. Um, the whole idea of it is <laughs> it's frightening. Um, some Polish women worked seasonally joining labor brigades of agricultural workers. Uh, the uh, horses and carriages would come into uh, the Fells Point community during the harvest season and the women and the children would get on these and be taken, traveled by wagon to pick vegetables on Maryland farms. Now these new arrivals obviously strained the housing accommodations of Fells Point. And you see during this period a really change in the architecture of the community. Upper stories are added. Rear wings are added. And gabled structures are uh, redesigned to accommodate other bedrooms. When the group arrived, typically they lived at first in boarding houses, which proliferated in the area, or else with relatives. In time, Poles saved and they moved from renting to home owning. In fact, the Polish community in Baltimore became by the 1930s, one of the highest ethnic groups in terms of owning their own homes. Census records reveal the large size of these Polish families. And unlike other immigrant groups, they continued to have higher birth rates uh, than natives, in part because of their uh, Catholicism. <coughs> And it is because of the numbers of them that they were able to create this community in Fells Point. Here, here are some typical stories uh, from studies of Fells Point relating to the Polish immigration. Ignacio Walensky, he's a shoemaker. He was born in Ksenia, Poland in 1840 one of the community's earliest migrates, migrants, he settled in Fells Point in 1868. His wife, Constania, arrived a year later on the SS Schiller from Bremen. After he found work, he wrote his older brother, Joseph, to emigrate. His brother's family arrived in 1872. Next, Ignacio's wife encouraged her family to emigrate and so on as concentric circles of poles, always located in Fells Point, became a community. Among the oral histories of these poles is that of Helen Bochemski, whose mother came to Fells Point age 12. Her father arrived with his family at 17. They came from the same village in Poland and for the same reason. And this is uh, her oral history. Everyone thought the streets were lined with gold. All you had to do was get to America and then you would be rich. 
My father worked in the slaughterhouse, my mother in domestic service. Then, as a family, we got into the profitable tavern business, <laughs> where we made enough money to buy a home. And that tavern still exists today as the Admiral's Inn. In another oral history from 1960, we're counting uh, in the Fells Point Gazette, which is a super uh, source of information about this group. A poll arrived in, his name is, is Maxim Ostitsky. He arrived in the U.S. in 1910. He remembered his father as working as a laborer, his mother in the cigar factory, and her mother living with them to care for their eight children. The most important institution in this new community was the Roman Catholic Church. In the beginning when this group came, uh, they had little choice but to worship in St. Michael's Catholic Church, which is, uh, was uh, nearby on Wolf Street. But the services in the congregation were German and Czech, and the Poles wanted their own church and they formed one of their earliest voluntary organizations in the St. Stanislaus Benevolence Society, which immediately went to Archbishop Gibbon and encouraged him to send them a priest of their own. Uh, the distinguished Archbishop <coughs> evidently did not know the difference between Czechs and Poles, because they soon got from Bohemia, Father Vacula, and he chose as his saint, Saint Wenesoff. And we all know that that is a Bohemian saint. So the community waited and planned and saved and lobbied. And finally in 1879, the bishop allowed a new priest to establish a parish to be named after a Polish saint. And uh, this, of course, the bishop, of, the famous bishop of uh, Warsaw, St. Stanislaus. And the church became the St. Stanislaus Koska Church. The archbishop, with uh, financial help from the community, purchased three lots over here on uh, Ann Street for the congregation to build Baltimore's first Polish church. After two years, this plain pressed brick, put this in for the architects here, uh, it's a solidly constructed Romanesque church with a rectangular tower, and it was finished in uh, May 1881. The community celebrated its consecration with a great parade. The archbishop sprinkled holy water on the outside walls, and the first physical landmark of Baltimore's Polonia was complete. For years, the great bells of St. Stanislaus kept the community together. They told when someone died. Uh, they told when a, uh, a couple was married. Uh, and uh, they told as well for the special Christian rituals that the Poles created here on Christmas and Easter. Often these involve special food. Now in time there would be other uh, Polish parishes and there would be disagreements with the Roman Catholic Church with which uh, the Poles thought always was much too Irish uh, dominated. <laughs> <laughs> but St. Stanislaus remained the essential institution in this community. It included a parochial school, and here the local children learn not just their ABCs, but lessons from Polish history. In the eight, 1950s, this was the only school in Baltimore uh, that still offered Polish to its students. It was also, there was a meeting room in the basement, and the church became what students of immigration like to call an adoptive institution. For a time, it educated more Polish children than the public schools. In fact, this first generation of Poles uh, was very suspicious of state-run public schools. Other Polish organizations appeared in Fells Point. 
Soon there were savings and loan societies, such, such as the Kosciuszko Permanent Savings and Loan on Eastern Avenue, founded by Polish immigrants who wanted their own financial institution. They couldn't understand uh, <clears throat> English very well, and they certainly did not want to hand over their well-earned money to those who were not part of their culture. So Poles who had begun their lives as peasants developed their understanding of a modern capitalist society. By 1920, there were so many of these Polish savings and loans that Eastern Avenue was dubbed the Wall Street of Fells Point. <laughs> there were as well mutual aid societies such as the Polish Home Club that provided sick and death benefits to those in the community and a Polish immigration help, a house dedicated to helping new arrivals. Even as they became less Polish and more American, Fells Point Poles maintained their loyalty to their beleaguered, and I do mean beleaguered homeland, through parades and other rituals. In 1910, for example, 5,000 Poles marched up Baltimore Street to Lakeview in remembrance of some medieval victory that the Poles had sustained over the Teutonic German Knights. Poles also celebrated the two great their heroes of the American Revolution that we associate with Poland, Kosciuszko and Pulaski. In 1902, they gathered in uh, Broadway Market Hall to thank a Polish representative from uh, Chicago for his efforts in Congress to establish a memorial to Pulaski. And as they do today, uh, the women and the children dressed in the, in the uh, traditional Polish costumes of white dresses, red sashes, and leggings. Uh, they ate pierogies, cabbage dumplings, and spiced sausage. And they always celebrated Polish Constitution Day in May. Now, these are cultural artifacts within a group that was inexorably becoming more American. Essential to this process of adoption, of partly keeping their culture, but partly becoming America, were several newspapers that circulated in the community. The most important was published by Vladislav Velsen. Beginning in 1891 and published intermittently into the 1930s, Velsen intended his monthly paper, which he called Polonia. And when that failed, he called the, the paper Friends of the Hearth. And the next time he fa it failed, he called it Unity. And he intended that it would support all Polish endeavors and tell the happenings of the Polish people in Fells Point. Translated today into English, it is surely one of the best sources of life uh, in this community in Fells Point. Featured, for example, uh, in the January 1900 edition were stories about the formation of a, committee, of a committee to protect workers who harvest oysters from exploitation, plans for a forthcoming festival, the story of a Polish man who had courageously risked his life to rescue a young child from drowning. A former president of the Stanislav Kaska Bene Benevolent Society, Velsan also owned a grocery and a saloon. And he was known in, in political history in Maryland as bragging that he could deliver 3,000 votes to the local Democrats. In time, the ultimate form of assimilation took place when one Frank Nowakowski won a seat in the, from the third ward in the Baltimore City Council. Finally, um, 
I learned to say finally, uh, and like Stevenson used to say, to give your, uh, give your audience some hope. <laughs> As is ever the case, um, there were tension and, and conflicts in, in the face of increasing pressures to uh, assimilate. Uh, during the period of the Spanish-American War, there was heavy emphasis uh, put on the necessity of making a Poles take English courses and become citizens. There was, at that time, also the emergence of anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant associations. And the assassination of uh, President McKinley uh, by a man with a, he was a Czech, but the name Chokos was close enough to Polish uh, to bring a forms of hostility toward this uh, community. And so, as I have said, in the 1920s, a new national origins quota system emerged uh, that severely limited the number of Poles who were admitted. In the meantime, Poles in Fells Point moved from objects of derision and prejudice. Those dirty Pollocks was one of the uh, terms. We, we have different forms of insults, and the one used uh, often was what Henry Mencken called Poles, brutal ignoramuses. In time, that prejudice disappeared and what was left was the understanding that uh, Fells Point had helped shelter this group. And that as their children and grandchildren slowly assimilated, some changed their names. Wolanski became Williams, Borowski became Burroughs. Children moved away from Fells Point, often up Broadway. The memory of the homeland faded. The Polonia of 1880 to 1930 became a memory, more culture than behavior, more memory than contemporary reality. Yet remains, what remains for us is a vivid tale of Fells Point history and an important episode in the history of Baltimore neighborhoods. Thank you. I knew Miss Helen oh, really? at the Admiral's Cup. I was leading oh, walking oh, tours in Fells Point. Really? And she was still yes. running the bar at Admiral's Cup. And she became, a, she married and was Christopher, right? <coughs> she married a merchant seaman who had been stopping by the bar oh, for a number okay. of years. <laughs> and there is a lady living around the corner today who conducts regular annual trips back to Poland. And I wanted to mention that the 100th anniversary of St. Stan's in 1981, I happened to be leading a group of walking tour people up uh, Ann Street when the priest came running out and gave me the book that commemorates oh, the 100th wonderful. anniversary, and I still have it. And there was one other thing. In the summertime, many of the women and children were conscripted bought and sold almost by a man whom I know here in Baltimore who's still alive who used to send them out to the countryside to pick crops. It's my like the indentured servant? Yeah. yeah. He, he did very well. I won't give his name, but it was a, So those were the three things I had to mention. Uh, the trip to Poland every year, the 100th anniversary of St. Stan's, uh, leaving in the summer to pick crops, and um, oh, the Caton Memorial. You didn't mention that in Harbor East. I went to the meeting where people were gathering to uh, get the money together to build that memorial. But it was a profound experience to be sitting there and listening to that history. Thank you. You're talking. Well, thank you for, for your contributions. Uh, I must say uh, one thing on Saint Stanislaus. Mm -hmm. I did a little uh, tour, and I wanted to go uh, in the church, and I had heard that it's 
had changed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Just slightly. Um, I, I was astonished. But then I thought, well, this is the process that we uh, go through. This is what these uh, folks call re recycling and re renovation. Do you, you all know what uh, is in St. Stanislaus now? What, what works out? What works out? Yeah. It was a and it's a fantastic building, though. It was a beautiful church. Yeah. They had dinners every year. It was wonderful. Uh, up yes. there. Yes, yes. they did. Uh -huh. All of our uh, yeah. Bohemian people, so to speak, but yes. not from Prague. Yeah. But my, my, my grandmother, my grandmother, my mother were part of those expeditions after the countryside. My mother, of course, was little. She thought it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather had to flee about um, the 1905 abortive revolution. And, in Russia? Uh, yes. He mm -hmm. and his uh, brother, uh, we have a wonderful photograph of them all in there. Dress uniforms, very czarist regiment. He was a translator. He spoke several languages. And uh, they were going to ship him heats after the Board of Revolution. He had various political connections and he was a little worried. He and his, bro his brother escaped, uh, like the Great Escape, they were skiers, by uh, pretending they were on a cross country ski trip from Poland all the way to Brennan. And they sold his skis and got on the ship. And the Army American. Uh, Thank you for that. That's a great story. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. There, there was a, a, a sort of a, 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 a second wave of immigration. What was it? Um, what would it have been in the 90s or something? Holy Rosary Church? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, after the fall of communism. But they didn't live here. They lived yeah. here. Uh, but I, you can help me about when what I call Polonia really disappears and we have a whole new community in Fells Point. When would those of you... Well, that was post-World War II. Post-World War II. People basically, um, in, in Fells Point or in Baltimore? Fells Point. Fells Point. But basically after World War II, uh, people went to, you know, they had already, there had been no immigration since 1925, so you didn't have that, those waves. Like yeah, you they today. have to keep replacing. You know, yeah. Uh, like Univision, things like yeah. that. And also, um, uh, people like the GI Bill, or whatever. My, grand, my father, my uncle graduated from Hopkins, uh, moved out to the suburbs, moved down in various parts of the country. And we used to come back on, on weekends and visit my grandmother, and uh, who lived on Wall Street, and various family members would come in on Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of other so many people were visiting that, that the cars were double parked in the street. Got the cars. I, please forgive me for saying these things. For <laughs> That's okay, story. man. It's the same story as mine. <laughs> and, and my grandmother lives on Gulf Street. So. <laughs> you, you had a question. I do. Or, or a point. I get, I'm getting more points than questions. <laughs> Is it a fair statement to say that the pre Mikulski Polish immigration period you're talking about was one of the most reactionary? kind of groups that came here to the States in the sense that they were so cowed by the Roman Catholic Church that the industrialists and the manufacturers here felt that they were a great source of workers who would work without questioning anything and didn't really in any way, shape, or form contribute to the movement, progressive movement, any kind, labor and otherwise, in the period you're talking about. I am just asking if you have a big <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to insult all. It's not an insult for these people. I'm, I'm not talking, talking I, about your I disagree about. with you uh, in, in a certain sense because there are some examples of Polish workers striking and being involved in labor actions in the period around World War I. Now, I'm not going to argue. Uh, that this is the most progressive ethnic uh, group that uh, came to the United States. My basic feeling about this is that it is very hard when one has the first generation. Uh, one is trying simply to get along. And it takes time uh, for any community to 
achieve a sense of stability to the point when you can challenge others. Now, you may point to the great exception here, and that is Jewish immigrants who come into New York and become socialist. socialists. We're hearing that word again. And they came to Baltimore. Her grandfather was the president of the union. Yeah. Right? The projection yeah. But I'm not talking about me personally. I'm just talking about the Roman Catholic group of Polish people that came. They wanted to make their lives better. I had no problem with it. But the problem was, it seems well, to me that they did not do anything to advance progressive ideas from America. Yeah. They probably did in, uh, in the maritime trades. They fought probably more than you think. And, um, it all depends on the skill levels. When you're unskilled at the bottom of the barrel, you're, 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 you're not going to do much. So the, in the packing houses, the canneries, the mostly women, they're, they're not yeah. going to raise a, a, a ruckus. Um, but in um, steel mills. And they were, and, and my understanding, well, little I know, little I know about the Catholic, Polish Catholics were a pretty divisive, contentious group who didn't all believe the same thing. They were tremendous. Yes, but, they, but they mostly uh, fought so among weren't necessarily, right. Well, I'm saying, but they weren't necessarily... Yeah. Yeah, this, they this. were fighting between the Polish and National Church. Sure. The but the Church and came first. I mean, well, I'm not criticizing Catholics, <laughs> Catholics are not as, as, especially a radical group. I, I think we would all agree with that. They're conservative. Molly McGuire. I've seen a lot of hostility. Molly McGuire. <laughs> <laughs> Molly McGuire. Exception. Exception. Dorothy Day. Yeah. Uh, for the most part. Yes, in the back. I'm, you were, I just wanted to clarify what the point I think on, on right here. Uh, it, it was built to bring in uh, immigrants. But it, the law it, it, effect, effectively it ended before it got kind of shape. I my it's always been told to me that marry a immigrant came through there. Back up and start again. Sorry. <laughs> Greg Peer. Oh. I believe never had. It, yeah, because yeah, yeah. It, it all ended in 1914. It, 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 yeah. Well, there are. Um, there were actually pictures in the Library of Congress of po Polish immigrants who have come from Locust Point. Right. And this is after World War I. And you see them with uh, you know, their trunks or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it was a staging place, perhaps. A lot of them landed at the end of uh, that extension of uh, Broadway that juts out. Uh, in fact, until about maybe the 70s, there were still some old buildings there where people would land and be uh, you know, processed or whatever. And you can see the we're, we're, we're confusing peers. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, so, I'd like to. Um, oh, oh, I have one more thing to say. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, we have a Statue of Liberty. And we can have a nice new one. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, by the way, there was a film made, I think it was the 70s or 80s, about the construction of the Statue of Liberty, starring Frank Langella and George Kennedy. It was filmed right here. Fellas Point was substituted for New York. We put dirt in the streets. Uh, our Broadway substituted for New York Broadway. And what is now the Admiral fell in was that famous lithograph of, uh, uh, you see, of New York and uh, Barnum's uh, Museum. And right on the end of um, Fell Street, which uh, was a pier, the pier there, which is now, which was messed up at the time, they had the uh, fiberglass, uh, full-size fiberglass mock-ups with the head the torch and other parts of the Statue of Liberty they used for the film that were left there for years. I just thought I'd throw that in. Thank you very much. You find that. Thank you all for coming. And to ask you to uh, stay for the refreshments, and you can consider, you can continue your conversation. Thank you all again for coming. Now I'd like to thank Gene.